MCC TV is largely about what happens in the classrooms of Metropolitan Community College. Our mission, of course, to give you a good idea of all the educational opportunities the college provides. But we also present interviews with speakers, authors, and performers who visit our campuses. And once per quarter, we sit down with the president and CEO of the Greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce for a chat about the cultural, social, and economic health and development of our viewing area. The conversation ahead is about what happened in 2018. I'm your host, Kent Pavelka, and David Brown joins us next on MCC TV. Welcome, David. Everybody who uh, joins us regularly, once a quarter, anxious to find out what uh, the end result of 2018 sure. is about. I was trying to figure out which of those categories I fit. I must be in the performer category. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what can you do? I mean, do you, I write? Do I speak? I perform, I suppose. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Happy well, 2019. I, same to you. I, I think you fit all those categories. I appreciate that. Um, so we do want to kind of uh, uh, break the mold a little bit here. Normally we talk about quarterly progress yeah. and, and those kinds of things, but let's recap the whole year. In generalities, what, how did you feel about 2018? You know, it was a really a spectacular year again. Uh, a lot of it was stuff that um, we had planned to move forward and we hit our goals and we're happy to hit them. Uh, several of them were about kind of community projects that kind of got announced that will tell the tale about what the, the community will be like over the next uh, really a couple of decades as we look forward to that Omaha 2040 uh, strategy. So we, I think it was a great year for accomplishing goals, for beginning the process of accomplishing things that we'd set out as goals for the next five years, and then some really great new projects for the community that will really change uh, the face of the community and the kind of future we can have. So it was an exciting year here. Touch on those big, those, and are, were those, all those unexpected or? Well, they're all projects that we, that, that the community has been working on for a long time. And so the, the collective we is, the chambers involved with most of them, the city's involved in all of them, uh, the not-for-profit communities involved with all of them, philanthropy, uh, private sector, there's always private sector leaders engaged. So it isn't like they are, were surprises, but they were things that were working sort of behind the scenes and there have been rumbles about them, but they're able to finally kind of come out into the light. So a good example is the Riverfront Redevelopment Project. Uh, I don't think anyone is surprised that there was a re Riverfront Redevelopment Project, sure. but the, the details of it came out this year and uh, they are truly awe-inspiring. I mean, they will change the face of downtown Omaha and our relationship with the river and our relationship with Council Bluffs forever. I mean, they are, it's truly dramatic. 290 million, give, give or take, with 5 million or so. So it's a $300 million project. 250 million of that is already committed by philanthropy. And the city has committed about 50 million for city infrastructure involvement, engagement, and such. So it's paid for. It's paid for. So we're not talking about a bond issue and tax increases and all that stuff. I mean, this is going to fundamentally change the way we engage each other in the urban core of our city from 14th Street at Jean Leahy Mall all the way down to the riverfront and all the way really from uh, Heartland America Park, uh, Lewis and Clark Landing, and all the way up to the Bob Carey Bridge. All of those are going to be impacted in a remarkable way to connect the city together. And of course, there's a Council Bluffs component yes. of this too that really kind of is an ex a continued expansion of, of Council Bluffs um, presence on the riverfront and it just grows and enhances our, the connection to the Omaha community. So just just really exciting. Just that one project alone is a game breaker. You bet. Then throw on top of that what uh, ConAgra has announced that they're going to do with their campus. You know, the, the ConAgra campus has a series of buildings on their campus, one of which now the chamber is located in. Uh, the one building that is not occupied is the former headquarters building. Um, and the ground around it and other, uh, we'll call it green space, if you will, on that campus. ConAgra has announced basically an extension of the old market into that campus with an extension of Harney Street all the way down to the lake with an entertainment district, with housing, with hotels, with restaurants, uh, a street, a grid streets uh, system. So you'll be able to kind of feel your way around the campus. And that abuts right up against the Riverfront Development Project at Jean Leahy Mall. 
that's a $500 million project. So you've got $800 million just between those two projects. Both of them will break ground this year in 19. And the details of both of both those, again, came out um, in 2018. So just, just those two projects, really exciting. And then look at the work that Paul Smith and his group are doing in the near north downtown of the old Ashton building and the Mastercraft neighborhood. And they're building that into kind of a tech hub that'll be right next to the arts hub that we already have there, which kind of combines creatives in these neat old warehouse buildings that'll accommodate companies like Flywheel, which will be growing in the old Ashton building. Just those three projects are just monumental. Any community would like to have any one of them. We've got all three of them happening all at once. Yeah, unbelievable. <clears throat> you mentioned the year 2040. Now, all of this is going to be done by then. Yeah, so <laughs> so the 2040 plan, remember we talked about what could Omaha be by 2040, and part of that study is a focus on place. Because as you talk to people about would they stay here, would they grow here, will they move here, and if you talk to companies about attracting people, recruiting people, and keeping people here, and companies having the careers necessary to attract those people, it all still gets down to will people stay here and will people want to be here. And so the, the whole place strategy for the 2040 plan said we need to be one of America's most innovative, engaging spaces. Our places need to be places that welcome people, that are inclusive, that people want to participate and they want to be here because we have these cool places that they can visit. We have a lot of those already in Omaha, the old market, uh, Blackstone, Benson, Midtown, Exarban, uh, the stuff that's still being built out west. You know, there's, there's a lot of good stuff going on. But to take it to the next level, to take it to one of those cities that people will think about and talk about all the time, we've got to be even more innovative and more engaging and think about the kind of spaces we're creating. You won't find more engaging or innovative spaces than what I've already talked about between this Paul, Paul Smith project, the Riverfront Redevelopment Project in ConAgra. Those are spaces that will kind of shock people into realizing what a cool place this is. And they will be with us as assets to attract people and keep people here for a long time, all the way into 2040. So, but what, what is the timeline in, in your estimation, or is there one regarding those three projects? You oh yeah, the, they will all be done uh, the construction in all of them will be done probably 2024, 20, 2025. And some of them will be done in phases. And so you'll see stuff done at you know, the end of 2020, or beginning of 2021. And you'll see some done by the beginning of 2022. And so you'll be, so we'll be seeing lots and lots of projects that are already going up. We'll, we'll be under construction for the next few years in downtown Omaha, but it's going to be exciting to see. Very cool. Um, before I leave this, I got to I got to mention. I saw that I think there are two videos about the riverfront uh, project. Mm -hmm. Those are amazing videos. If, if people don't have a clue what's coming, uh, and I don't know where you go to tell them to go to access those. Well, you can look riverfront redevelopment project Omaha, and there's a the search engine will take you to a website that has this uh, three dimensional flyby, if you will. So the plans have been drawn. Um, you know, they're still pricing and doing all that kind of good st stuff to it, but you'll see what the dream is for mm -hmm. that riverfront development project because it's literally a 3D fly through through all the different amenities and the uh, takes you around all the different buildings and up and down the riverfront. I mean, it, it, it is a, a great way to get excited yes. about something that's going to happen around here. Really good description by community leaders, et cetera, about the vision. Yeah, there's yeah. some great comments and some great commitments. And then you can, if you're a visual learner, you can stamping on your memory what these things are going to look that's like. That's what I did. And then exactly. a few years from now, you'll be able to walk through it to say, that looks a lot like what I saw on TV, you know, four or five years ago. So, um, so let's talk numbers here. Sure. Uh, projects, uh, retention, expansion, et cetera. Yeah, so we had 33 projects that we closed this year, which for us means a company has committed to a certain amount of capital investment or jobs. Um, Last year, I think we had 75. This year, we had 33. Over the five-year period, we more than we averaged more than 60 projects a year. So this is the also happens to be the last year of our most recent five-year strategy and campaign. So, Prosper Omaha 1.0 basically finished in 2018. So we averaged easily more than 60 projects a year that we landed. This year, we actually had capital investment of more than 1.4 billion. The goal for the year is about 600 million. So we blew past that. Uh, we had Are you more, surprised you got to that number with 33 projects compared no, to the number of projects the year before? We're seeing some 
big investment project. So you get a, when Facebook announced phase two of their data center project, that was a billion dollars right there. So uh, we kind of went past our annual goal with one project yes. on the capital investment side. But jobs, not so much. I mean, data centers are great, but they're not big job producers, even though they, they pay well. Uh, so we still had a goal of 2,400 jobs. And you met it. And we met that. Um, and the, the best news probably is the lion's share of those jobs were jobs that paid more than the median wage here in this market, uh, which our goal was, was to, I think, hit more than 75% of the jobs would, would be in excess of the median wage in this market. And so um, we, as you know from our last conversations, we've changed our, we actually ratcheted upward the goal for the amount of wages that, that projects would, that employers would pay for jobs up to more than $50,000 a year. Uh, but we hit our, our numbers for 2018. Uh, but the way to really tell if there's um, success, I think, is also the backlog that, that you have. So last year, right now, we have 199 companies that we're working with. <clears throat> so our backlog is really strong. And our hope is that we'll continue to add to that backlog every year by either eliminating projects that disappeared and didn't land here or landing a good number of those projects and yeah. then backfilling behind them with more projects. Um, and so we'll end up with that 40 or 50 or 60 project goal again coming forward as we move forward in, into the future. So, I mean, we had 65 companies locally that expanded mm -hmm. that we had something to do with, which are, those are good numbers again, about you know, more than half of our projects obviously that we're, we're dealing with um, our expansion projects and another 60 or so our, our companies that are, or more than 60, are actually companies thinking about, about us from the outside. Um, and a bunch new to the market. A good number of them new to the market. I mean, we'll, we have about 130 companies new to market are considering us right now. Uh, and at the same time, we're playing with about 100 startups. So, you know, we have this process of identifying individuals who actually have a product or a service that they want to, to provide. And we, we kind of start them on a process of, of acceleration, we'll call it. So first, first phase is figure out what problem you're trying to solve and you have customers that want you to actually solve that problem. And then we take them step by step by step through a process that by the time they get to step seven or eight, they have validated their, their, their product or their process. They have customers saying, yes, I'll buy it from you. They're building their, their organizational structure and their corporate structure. They're making sure they have a staff to help build the team and they're getting ready to start going out there for financing. So we've got about 100 individuals that we're working with right now that are starting companies. And this past year, I think we ended up with about 30 or so true startups that came out the other end that said, um, we have customers and now we're trying to take it to the next level. How are we gonna try and, and grow um, our businesses? And those are primarily tech startups. So, in the financial services space, which is you know insurance, banking, payment space, that kind of stuff. Um, but we're also working with uh, different types of startups. So through the REACH program, which we've talked about in the past, um, you know, we're, we've helped over the last three years, about 25 or 26 small contractors get started. Uh, so think about uh, the individual that might be um, a concrete specialist who can can lay pavement like the best of them, but has been doing it for most of his or her career and they decide they want to have a company to do that instead. We can walk them through a process to help them learn how to be a business owner, how to hire people, how to bid documents, how to make sure your finances are right, how to become boundable, all those kind of things. So These are individuals you are in, <clears throat> in certain industries that have yeah, been so employees? That pr primarily construction guys, pr men and women who are you just really want to be not doing it themselves, but now having a company to do it, hire people to, to start a small business to do it. And so we show them how to do that. And this is the REACH program. This is the REACH program. Yeah. It's one of the things that the REACH program has done. And then we also started, along with the Iowa West Foundation and Council Bluffs, the Kitchen Council this year, which is designed to help um, aspiring food companies um, get a leg up in the commercial market. So. Um, I like to tell the story about my, my grandmother's raspberry jam that everyone always said, boy, if you could sell this yeah. in the store, I'd buy it. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let's show people who have products, men and women who love to cook, who, who really want to or love to bake, whatever it might be, oh, wow. but, but they want to do it in a commercial scale. Let's show them how to do that. And so we opened an Where incubator. Where do I sign up for my chili? 
recipe. You can call Holly Benson, who okay. is our director of the Kitchen Council, and she can show you how to take that chili recipe and build it to a volume that would be sufficient to sell in a commercial sector and then tell you, show you how to package it and how to, wow. how to follow, follow all the regulations necessary and then how to write a business plan. And See, this is Colonel how to, how Sanders, that forward. Colonel Sanders, uh, you know, number number two, he didn't get started until late. No, he didn't. This chili is big. Perfect. It's going to be big. I, I can see it now. Ken's chili. I, 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 <laughs> I can see it now. That's but very you, cool. It is cool. And so we, we hope that, I think this past year, we helped 10 companies engage in that process. And our goal, though, is to have 10 to 20 startups every year that will go through that incubator. Uh, and it's a perfect fit for this region. And it's great that it's in Council Bluffs. I mean, there's a, a big food um, history in Council Bluffs and in Omaha, and it just fits there. So... Iowa West Foundation is helping us take some risk and move that process forward. So, um, you know, I think all in all, from an economic development perspective, we had a really robust year. Um, we had 60 company visits last year, so that's a, a really good indication of companies that are interested, you know, in, in seeing us. And, you know, we've, we've landed, you know, plenty of companies and contracts for small companies during, for construction and started up a lot of, a lot of companies and gotten a lot of image uh, enhancement from the market. Talk a little bit about uh, Career Rocket in 2018, the definition of that. What you yeah. Doing. So, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of time and energy on talent. Um, they're with a very low unemployment the way we have it now. Companies are, are at a premium to try and find the people that they need. And in the short term, there's, there's limited fixes for that. You can attract more, you can keep more of, the, of our local people that are moving on through a lot of aggressive efforts to make that happen. But long term, one of the best answers is to make sure we're developing our own talent and that that talent is growing up here. They like the community. It's a great spot. How do we get them interested in the kind of careers that are here? And so after a bunch of research a few years ago, we realized that a lot of students here don't realize the kind of careers that they can have in this market. So this is outreach. It is. So we start with uh, public schools and ask them to identify uh, as many students as they can from middle school through high school who would like to have a career experience for a day. And then we approach companies and say, look, we've got all these students that are interested in, in seeing what you do for a living and how they might have careers in your company. So we did this two years ago, and our goal was 10,000 students in one week. So companies agreed during a specific week that they would have career experience opportunities for students, and the teachers and the school administrators agree that their students can participate. You more than double that, right? So we had 12,000 the first year. Came back the next year and did about, we said we were going to do 15,000. We actually did 20,000. Um, this year our goal is about 25, 25 to 30,000 for 19. So in 18, we did 22,000 students, which is crazy if you think about it. It's one, one week of the year, 22,000 students got to expose. Do it, do it on everything. one week? In one week, all in one week. When, and, when in the, during the year? Uh, it, was in, it's in February, it was in February the second year. It was in April the first year. But April is also standardized testing month. So that became a bad um, week to do that, and so we moved it up to February. It'll be in February again in, in 19. So, um, yeah, it's terrific. So kids who have never had a, a notion about what's it like to be an attorney or a banker or a fireman or a military person or an uh, electrician or a welder or whatever it might be, and we gave them all those experiences. Did you, did you try to accommodate all the interests? or you We do. Yeah. Um, you know, I think um, last year we got the vast majority of the students who signed up, we had a, a career opportunity for them, and our goal, of course, is to always to meet that demand. Um, we've gone from basically just OPS now to having you know, several of the school districts around us engage in that process. So it's one of our longer-term goals of setting up, uh, if you started in middle school two years ago, our hope is that all of, in every middle school year and high school year, you get a different career opportunity. So you could theoretically be faced with five or six opportunities to see a different career through your middle school and high school years. Everything that's uh, old again is new, or new again is old. Uh, we used to call these field trips. Yes, we used to call them field <laughs> trips. That's right. Yeah, very yeah, good. Right. Um, did you mention Prosper Omaha? 2.0? I did not. So, um, you know, in 2017, we did the Omaha 2040 plan to say, what should we be working on? In 18, we spent the year um, crafting the strategy to how we would accomplish um, our next five years worth of work within the Chamber for Economic Development. And, and for the first time, we expanded it outside just the economic development um, agenda and basically made it the Chamber agenda. 
because it started get looking at things that were outside of just creating jobs and investment. It started including things like uh, transportation planning and regional transportation projects. It started looking at talent in ways we've never looked at talent, not just attracting talent, but developing talent. And it looked at diversity and inclusion. What, what role can the business community play in becoming more diverse employers and having more inclusive cultures? And how do we translate that across the community? Um, we started looking at site development and innovative parks and big projects like that I've talked about already. It seemed like it was becoming more and more um, holistically engaged with the Chamber's agenda rather than just narrowly engaged with their economic development agenda. Mm -hmm. So we took Prosper 2.0 and sort of blew it up and said, this is, this is what the Chamber does. Add a membership services component to our strategy and you've pretty much got what the Chamber does. It focuses on public policy that will impact people, place, and prosperity. Of course, there's an economic development agenda there. There's a community development agenda. And so um, Prosper 2.0 became our new strategy, and then we had to raise the money to implement that strategy. So the goal to raise is about $32 million. Um, by, by the end of uh, 2018, we'd raised a little more than $22 million. Uh, so we've got about six months left for us to raise the rest of those dollars. Uh, we knew we wouldn't likely get it all done in year one, <clears throat> the fundraising. But we got enough completed that we could start the year and begin our process. And then by the time we get to June or July, I think we'll have the rest of it raised. And uh, we'll be moving forward to kind of make, make big things happen. I want to touch on all the, the rankings that uh, the city enjoyed in terms of uh, various publications and whatnot. But uh, something just occurred to me i got to ask you about. You, you talk... We always talk about the millions and hundreds of millions of dollars that, that need to be raised for, you know, to get projects going that in turn will eventually pay for themselves sure. and, and more so. But do you find it, how difficult is it, is it in this community, in this area, to have to go back to the same people all the time? Because there's a, hmm. there's a finite number of people who can do that, right? Well, there is, and, and you, you don't want to keep going back to the same old, same old. But what you also find is that the folks who are investors, um, we, we never presume that they want to invest. So when we're planning the next phase, so we're running, a good example is Prosper 2.0. We, we started doing the Omaha 2040 strategy in 2017 because we went out and talked to our investors and said, two years from now, we're going to run out of money. That's fine. We can stop right now. Or we can try and build strategy that will excite you about doing something into the future again. What would you like us to do? And they said, well, come back to us with something that we can really sink our teeth into. And so we bring a product back to them. They say, yeah, that's really what I want to see how th this community engage in. So the first thing is you don't ever take it for granted that there's someone's going to write you a check this time just because they wrote you a check last time. And secondly, they should be challenging us to do things that are not just purposeful, but are strategic and will continue to improve the community, improve our chances as a, uh, an, an economic force to continue doing better. So we ask our investors, don't just automatically write us a check. That's, that's easy, but it's just as easy for you to tell us no if we're not inspiring you and exciting you to new things. So this Prosper 2.0 thing we're doing, it's the biggest raise we've ever done for operations because this that $32 million doesn't, get loaned to companies. It's not a for facade and grants and improvements. I mean, this basically funds the effort to accomplish the things we wanted to get done in our strategy. It just seems to it, me like... It's big money. Yeah, it is. And, and I don't think money. that as a uh, popular, you know, at, as a great, at the greater community really stops to think about the, the kinds of investments oh, people make and, and to make our it. community so good. I guarantee it. I mean, when that riverfront development project is done, everyone will go, wow, this is really cool. Give and the no last thing they'll think, happen. Yeah, they'll have no thought about the fact that $250 million of philanthropy, money, donations were given by individuals and by foundations to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And every major project you can think of around here is the same way. Um, either they're done, um, totally on a philanthropic basis or they're done as a public-private partnership in some way. And those things are done in Omaha much more significantly and frequently than you find them in, I would say, any other community in the country. There's a great debt <clears throat> owed there. And these people, by and large, are pretty anonymous. There, and, there really yeah. is. You know, and, and what's funny is when you talk to them about it, in many cases, they think that they're paying back a debt um, because of the 
the kind of life that they've sure. led, the success that they've had in the marketplace. Win-win. And you know, we're saying, we bless you folks for saying you're, you're paying it forward, but w without them, Omaha is not the kind of community that it is. So we owe a huge debt of gratitude to you know, the corporate giants that came before us that have basically said the dollars that we earned in this community, we're gonna put right back into foundations or the individuals who lead big companies here, or even those individuals who might not have big companies but have made a good living and want to continue to give money back. We're, we're just blessed with those folks who want to see Omaha thrive. In all your days, <laughs> has anybody ever lobbed you a better softball than that? No. Than I just did? No, you did a great job there. You really did. I appreciate <laughs> no, that. No, it needs to be said. It well, does. It, it does need to be said. We, we, I can't, we can't say thank you enough to not just the people who write checks, but to the people who volunteer. I mean, I, I serve on a lot of boards and committees here in town, and I'm constantly amazed at the these business leaders who have lots of other things they can do with their time, but who spend it serving on not-for-profit boards and leadership and help them solve community problems and issues. So, yeah, and a lot, you know, of, and a lot of the people are the same people. They are, and, and when when they retire, their successor takes up the mantle and yeah. says, "This is important to our company, just like it is to the community." So we've been we've been blessed with great leadership and great philanthropy here. Oh man, only a few minutes left. A <laughs> bunch of ratings, rankings. Number one best cities for college grads. Yeah, uh, number that. one uh, coming uh, up and coming tech spot. Mm -hmm. We we'll go through some of that. Yeah. So when you see, when you see the rankings on the screen, um, there's lots of folks that are skeptical about any kind of ranking, and I understand, because frankly, I'm, I, I'm skeptical about them too. But the fact is, somebody took the time to do the ranking, and if Omaha comes out on top, or if Omaha comes out in the top 10, that means we did something right. Now, sometimes, we don't get all the rankings that we want. But, you know, there are times when we do really well, and, you know, we need to shout about it to the rest of the world, because even if, if someone says you're ranked number one, you know, this much of the universe sees that, unless you make it a point to make sure they see it. And so we've got a terrific communications team at the chamber who gets the word out about these rankings. And so recently we've actually seen a trend of number one, number two, number, you know, top five rankings when it comes to tech talent and millennials, et cetera. And so we combine all that stuff together into a story and get that word out around the world. Um, the word about Omaha is starting to get out there, yep. and people are starting to recognize us. So that's a really good thing. Tremendous PR, number one uh, metropolitan area for millennials, number seven in the top ten cities for creatives, number nine top ten cities for starving artists, number five <laughs> for the best state for business, and on and on it goes. Yep. Um, I'm going to ask you to do economic outlook for 2019 in one minute. In one minute. I can do that. It, it actually has started out really, really strong, so we should have two or three Good sized announcements coming up here very, very quickly. Um, we're hoping that we are able to say that we're again the best economic development organization for communities of our size in, in the country according to Site Selection Magazine because we've won that three out of the last four years and four out of the last five years. We're hoping that we get that again this year. Um, I think it's going to be a great year again and we've got a really good start on the year. Do you have numbers that you've made public as far as goals are concerned? Yeah, so again, we're, we're trying to get to, um, we've, we've taken five-year goals and we're breaking them down into one-year or one-year increments. So, uh, you know, I think we're looking at about um, six to seven hundred million dollars a year again in capital investment. Um, we're looking at about um, 2,500 jobs, 2,000 jobs a year and most of them at fifty thousand dollars a year or more. Um, so about another uh, close to a billion dollars in investments, and we'll blow past that number again this year because of some big investments we know are coming down the pike. Uh, about 50 startups a year on the tech side. So, I mean, j just those alone are some really big uh, numbers that we need to be able to match. Thanks for what you do, man. I appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. And thank you for being with us on MCC TV. Our goal is to better acquaint you with the mission, leadership, and the reach of the college. I'm Kent Pavelka for Metropolitan Community College.